I'll be chairing this panel, which is on crisis in the left in Europe. We have a group of all-stars, in my estimation. Of course, we have Vespin Analaki from NYU and the New School, who will speak on the Greek situation. Marcus Grouch from the left forum. And what are the German uh, affiliations? I'm from the so-called interventionist left and um, a group called FELS for Left Current in Berlin. And recently I also became again a member of the party Die Linke. Uh -huh. The left. Die Linke. Bruno Gulli from uh, Kingsborough in Germany, uh, who will speak on uh, the Italian. You know, we're very stereotypical. We have the Greeks speaking on the Greeks and the Germans, you know, it's a, it's a little bit nationalistic, but you have to, yeah, you have to uh, excuse us. I'll go beyond it. Yes, And Carlos Frade from uh, downtown Salford, the University of Salford, on the, uh, on the Spanish uh, situation. Now, the panel is uh, organized and sponsored by AKNY, which is a New York-based uh, movement in solidarity with with the crisis in Greece, in the, in the Greek left. So we will begin, I think, with uh, Vespina, then Marcus, then Bruno, and then Carlos. Okay. Maybe about 10, 12 minutes each. Sure. At the most, okay. yeah, at the most. Uh, so let me thank you all for coming here today. Um, and uh, I would just like to, to start with a brief uh, quote by my, our friend, actually, and a comrade like Kostas Panagiotakis, who spoke at the Historical Materialism Conference. And he finished his talk with the following. Uh, of course, I mean, the title of my uh, presentation here has to do with the great expectations around Syriza, successes and failures. So I guess his quote uh, <coughs> refers to those great expectations. So he finished his paper saying how Syriza will forge and deliver its message will be one of the factors that will help determine how the current capitalist crisis in Greece, Europe, and the world is resolved. So I guess the bar for Syriza has been set a little too high. <laughs> so similarly, uh, in uh, June of uh, 2012, before, right before the elections in Huffington Post, there was an article published with the title, Could Syriza success mean a new boldness for the international left? Now, a question, of course, that it was answered in the affirmative. Uh, the author, Alex McDonald, suggested that the second most socially unacceptable N world, nationalization, may soon be again a word thrown about the place without causing the steer and anxiety that it currently generates, and that Syriza's rise, in quote, the best showing the left has had in ages, end of quote, as he described it, could be a sign for much better things to come. Now, working with AK and Y, AK stands for left movement, uh, Greece Solidarity Movement, and Syriza New York, both newly established groups here in uh, the city, which work to raise awareness and bring attention to the economic, social, and political degradation in Greece. I've been really quite a few times surprised by the kind of attention and the seriousness of interest we have received by various groups. Now, the expectation that Syriza will pull the rug from under capitalism's feet is pervasive. More specifically, it is expected that the escalation of the economic, social, and political crisis, especially in the European South, maybe even in the Balkans, along with the change of policy which Syriza promises to follow upon election, breaking with the economic policy of austerity and the assaults against labor, will trigger a series of events which will lead to a new era for the European Union and possibly to a European Socialist Union. Now, Syriza knows full well, I think we all understand that, that any efforts to challenge the current European policies have to find wider support. Alexis Tsipras, the leader of Syriza, has called for an economically, and I quote him here, an economically viable strategy that must follow the model of 1953 London debt agreement, which gave the post-war German economy a kickstart and helped it create the economic miracle of the post-war era, end of quote. Now, in order to push this agenda, he has called on the assistance of the European left and trade unions. The problems, as well as the great expectations, I think are found precisely at this juncture. 
When in London, Alexis Tsipras appealed to the Labour Party, which he described as one of the few parties so close to power in Europe with whom we share a lot of positions and with whom we can be in constant communication. However, now as we all know, that party Labour has very little to do with uh, its long past and uh, very much to do with the policies of uh, Tony Blair with the war in Iraq and the neoliberal policies which merely continued the destruction started by the recently diseased Margaret Thatcher. The European left to which Syriza appeals has for years now mutated into what was euphemistically described as social democracy and often executioners of neoliberalism. Trade unions, much like in the case of Greece, in most cases have actively collaborated in the promotion of those policies and the implementation, most recently, of those austerity programs. Now, the greatest expectation here is that under the pressures of the economic crisis and the social havoc that austerity has caused, trade unions will abandon the path they have been following for years, supporting the European economic elites, and their governments and and their governments and will shift their course of action, challenging the system on its basis. We have some examples such as the uh, recent strike uh, called in January, uh, the subway transportation workers in Greece called an indef as an indefinite strike, which brought the city of Athens to a standstill for eight days and gained the support of transport workers in other sectors, working off their jobs in solidarity, actually did send a message of hope for the radicalization of the unions and European labor in general. Now, while Syriza raises against time in the short period since the coalition of the radical left exploded into the European political scene, can count a number of successes. In June of 2012, Syriza ran for elections with the following platform, and I summarize here. One, negotiations for debt cancellation with provisions for the protection of social insurance funds and small savers. Two, a pan-European tax on wealth, financial transactions and profits. Three, nationalization of the banks and their integration into the public banking system under social and workers' control. Four, immediate reconstitution of the minimum wage and, recon and, um, and reconstitution of real wages within three years. Five, uh, immediate reconstitution of collective labor agreements. Six, the introduction of direct democracy and institutions of self-management under workers and social co under workers and social control at all levels. Seven, speeding up the asylum process and abolition of Dublin Second. Uh, regulations and granting of travel papers to immigrants. Now, Syriza, basically with that program, scared the hell out of the European Union, the Bank of Europe and the IMF. The backlash was a carefully orchestrated and viciously executed international media campaign. Against all odds, Syriza managed, however, within a month to raise its electoral vote from 16% to almost 27% and came very close to winning the elections. Now, some of the greatest successes of Syriza, however, are not all of its own. Syriza appeals to and is co-instituted along with an increasingly radicalized people who have been mobilizing beyond and against the traditional lines of party politics. And I will elaborate here with just a few examples. Uh, from the Greek indignados who occupied for months the Syntagma Square, the central square of Athens in 2011, to the metro workers who led the recent strikes organizing through popular assemblies, to the anti-fascist groups which fight the Golden Dawn face to face on the streets of Athens, to the neighborhood committees which along with immigrant workers organize and stage protests, it is evident that the strongest opposition comes directly from the people of Greece. And by that, I do not mean just ethnic Greeks, but people of all ethnic, racial, and religious backgrounds who live and work in Greece and who have, or should have, actually, equal rights to work, justice, and freedom. General strikes and popular mobilization have destabilized and eventually brought down two different governments since 2009. By November 14, 2012, when a general strike was called across Europe, Greece would go to a national stoppage for the 21st time in two years. In general, workers and trade unions are caught up, however, in a fragmented labor market characterized by what is called flexible employment conditions, 
and are faced with an unequal strength, a struggle, against employers who have been greatly invigorated by recent legislation. Yet, other forms of resistance have greatly hampered the government's austerity plans. Financial resistance, for instance, has been elevated almost into supreme civil, civil duty. Small business owners collectively resist paying the new increased taxes and fees. Some city councils have encouraged their citizens not to pay these taxes imposed by the government through the electricity bill, always under the threat of electricity cuts, of course, while providing the necessary legal coverage. Now, as a result, thousands, result, thousands of households resist these practices of rampant taxations imposed on the lower and middle strata of the Greek society. <coughs> Movements such as the Won't Pay mobilize precisely around these kinds of efforts. Also, in many parts of the country, people try to circumvent the austerity by adopting a bartering system. Now, these may be tactics of survival, basically, under the extreme conditions of the economic crisis, but they also constitute revolutionary practices which challenge not merely the government policies, but the system of capitalism at its root. Unfortunately, I would have to, we would have to note here that despite the struggle and despite that strong resistance, not that many gains have uh, been made yet, at least. Syriza now, as you already heard, is a coalition party that plays host to various left-wing organizations ranging from revolutionary socialists to radical reform-oriented and to many unaffiliated individuals. While moving towards becoming a more unified political group, Syriza held its first national conference in November 2012, and yet it does not adhere to traditional party politics, at least not yet. While this might be a circumstantial occurrence, it also constitutes a success for despite the challenges that the party faces from within in its effort to bring together such a diversity of views and political outlooks, and despite the pressures from the outside, it still weathers out the storm while in the process it builds something new in the Greek political scene. Yet Syriza has not always successfully dealt with the challenges. In an effort to balance parliamentary and strict <coughs> politics, it has in many occasions remained on the sidelines or only belatedly joined grassroots initiatives and movements. Most importantly, I think, Syriza often finds itself trapped in a discourse carefully orchestrated by the media and the think tanks adhere adhering to the current government about legality and lawlessness. I will, pro I could, I will provide you, if I have time, <laughs> with a couple of examples here. Uh, in December of 2012, for instance, riot police raided what is known as Villa Amalias, a building occupied for more than 20 years now by anarchists, anti-authoritarians, anti-fascists. When the building was reoccupied, 92 people were arrested and were released only after strong protests in the streets of Athens uh, came together in support. Similar attacks have taken place against other long-term occupations in an effort to suppress what the government identifies as anomie and violation of the public order. Now, when Syriza was called to address the issue, the party very easily was actually painted in the media as anarchist sympathizers prone to violence, violence and unlawful attitudes. This communication trick has been one of the hardest to challenge with a counter discourse about the imperative of civil disobedience at moments when the rule of law systematically violates civil as well as human rights. The government and its accomplices in the media have found tremendously successful the old narrative about the two extremes. The extreme right, on the, ro the role of which, of course, neo-Nazi Golden Dawn is successfully encouraged and supported to play, and of the extreme left, which in this line of events, of course, is represented by Syriza. Now, in the background of this discourse, memories and images of Stalinism have been particularly evocative. I could continue here with more examples, but I guess I have not much time. So I will just conclude by just saying that, however, the above are not on the only challenges that Syriza has not been able to overcome, stressing that protest, dissent, and civil disobedience are imperative in the process of so social change and the defense of democracy. Since 2012, Syriza is increasingly folding back to positions that are designed to appeal what is largely described as the center or the, ce or the center right, while also trying not to alienate the European political and economic leadership. 
Yet, the greatest challenge and probably the greatest failure, as I see it at least of Syriza, has been in articulating and clearly communicating a program that on the one side will be open to adjustments according to future developments and contingencies, and on the other will be based on some clearly defined objectives. At this point, the upcoming conference of the party in July may have something important to add toward that direction and open the way to a discussion, a very public discussion, on uh, ways of restructuring, for instance, the economy, the production as a whole, and on providing health coverage and public education and so forth. It is only on the basis, I think, of such clarity and also courage that Syriza will be able to solidify and probably expand its ex electoral basis. Syriza, time and again, has made it clear that it's neither a utopian nor a revolutionary party. Yet, I think that we live through events that require revolutionary practices and a vision clearly fixed to a future that will be strikingly different than what we have experienced so far. Marcus. I've just moved on, okay. I didn't have prepared such a paper because I wanted to respond a little bit on that what Despina is saying because as a German um, and as a lefty um, you can imagine that I feel of course um, very desperate and also um, I'm not only upset but um, deeply um, yeah, emotional feelings on that what happened to the Greek people, to the people in Portugal and in Spain because of basically our government and the people where I live in, we, those people, we, well, not me, but many people, elect those government. Still, we have a democracy um, and this democracy came from uh, basically Greek, Greece. I hope um, sooner, uh, if we go on with our fight, those ideas you just presented will um, um, hopefully also uh, come to Germany. We talk about the s s uh, similar situations on the left. However, we face a deep crisis within the left. Um, it was the Social Democratic Party, basically, who uh, started in 2002 a very fundamental labor market reform called the Agenda 2010. And this uh, labor market reform results in the out-competition of all the labor forces and uh, the companies in the European South. It means the German labor force is right now the cheapest you can get as a capitalist in Europe. There are people who are working for one euro an hour. It's a, for, it's, a forced, it's a kind of forced labor, of course. Doing that means, of course, that people cannot go to work or will be outcompeted, getting un unemployed in the South. Kanzler Schroeder is proud of having done so. He said in Davos at the World Economic Forum that he is proud that he made this um, low-wage labor market sector. The Social Democratic Party is now 150 years old and was the strongest, one of the strongest forces the working class in the globe had. It was. With Schroeder, capitalist, of course we had for before that neoliberalism and so on, but with Schroeder, Definitely the, let's say, social welfare, the, the alliance, let's say the cooperation between workers and capitalists negotiating about the wages and the labor market and the labor process and so on was definitely over. However, the pity is that the German working class does not really get that shit. I mean, Right now, still, people are taking working conditions on an, as I said, a very cheap level, on an understand, on a very intense level. So that means the working condition, you work faster, 
you produce more in the same time. And this, of course, again, outcompetes all the others. The burnout rates right now are going through the roof. It is psychological, the psychological illness or diseases um, are getting more, getting, uh, it's a main, basically it's a main illness right now if people say I can't, if they call in sick, which they still can't do. They say I can't do it anymore, just now I need to relax. And you know all those that people believe, uh, if I'm here in the United States, they say you have this vacation and so on. And um, of course also if you walk around uh, certain cities in, in Europe, you might see that people still have feel a little bit relaxed and drink their latte macchiato and coffee and, and mm -hmm. so on those things. But this is really just as a picture that the deep root behind this, if you go behind the picture, is a, is a tremendously um, society which is really ill. And it works its, itself to death. And we, by doing this, by doing this, we also led to the fact that people kill themselves in Greece, in Spain, and so on. Because this kind of pressure which is put into our heads and which German people, you know, they are ruled by, f we are ruled by fear since, since, since ages. And this is basically what Schroeder da did. He, he made it happen that the working class is full of fear of what losing his job, or her job. The radical left, on the other hand, was very, very, for a very long time, not concerned anymore about uh, the labor conditions and the working conditions. The radical left, not. The trade <coughs> unions a little bit, but the radical left was engaged with anti-racist fights, with uh, anti-feminism, with uh, fights about the ecology and so on. It's all okay, it's br brilliant. But they really, in the last 20 years, they almost forgot the fight about the working conditions, the social conditions, and so on. We thought about housing conditions and so on, maybe, about uh, the, the thing. But we didn't really engage into the struggle on the workplace. It is a failure. Since, I let, would say, four or five years, um, many or more people in the radical left start to engage again in, the, in this struggle. And of course it's a crisis which led to the fact that this has happened, and much more so. It's the struggle of the people in Greece, and it's the struggle of course the people in the, uh, in the Arabian region, the Occupy movement, which basically led to the fact that um, we are getting engaged more in the struggle uh, around the whole conditions, basically. But the society is in fear. So we don't have very much support. And on the other hand, of course, we have a very strong right. It's Kanzler, Kanzler Merkel is part of the Christian Democratic Union. This is a conservative party, although they are shifted to a social democratic one. But within that, there is the strongest right force. And they are basically always, if this comes to negotiation in parliament, make it worse. If you want to do some a little bit of welfare, they will cut it off. And they are the people who are tremendously built a national kind of identity, an ideology which is very dangerous. The Bild Zeitung, the famous uh, newspaper which six mil or more, many million workers read still, as a conservative boulevard magazine, a uh, daily newspaper, said it's the laziness of the Greek which basically causes the crisis. They don't pay their debt because they're so lazy. This is a picture. At that moment, um, we got all the radical left again together and said, no. If, if we don't stood up now, although people still believe it, it's we are relatively well off, uh, not only the European Union will fall apart, but we might get a, a really um, um, devastating future. So we organized ourselves in the first place. We made a couple of marches. We tried to bring the story across 
we don't want to, we will not pay your crisis, we support the Greek people, nobody listened. The usual suspect went onto the streets in Stuttgart, in Frankfurt, in Berlin, everywhere we could guess, uh, we could bring, let's say, 10,000 people. It's almost no story in the news, okay? Nobody recognized those issues. That there's any form of protest, this is not recognized. We, we bring the story to the Greek people, so some Greek comrades and so on, and they try to uh, bring it there, at least to say there is some solidarity, there is some struggle in the heart of the beast and so on. It's really difficult. In Frankfurt, we made a big action against the European Central Bank and the Troika in last year. You never have seen a city blocked by the police at in that, that moment in April. People who, are f who, are, who still have fear about uh, the na Nazism, the, the, the time between 1933 and 1945, the way at a time where the police basically and the military ruled the whole country. I, I think we all waked up a little bit in a nightmare. I mean, police was really everywhere. We couldn't walk. If you assembled with three people on the, on the street, you were searched. So this caused another fear, of course, you have to overcome. It was really difficult. They blocked the European Central Bank. We, people tend to normalize those things, you know, but at the end of the day, it was basically the abandonment of democ democracy. It was, a, it was a glimpse of what it would be if the dictatorship of the financial market will be in full force and in full place. Because it is, abandonment of democracy means you cannot assembly in public if you want to. You cannot do that. And this happened for a couple of days in Frankfurt last year. The liberal left, on the other hand, was upset also by those things. But as you can imagine, they are still liberal. So they think it's a failure of uh, one guy, uh, the failure of the, uh, um, let's say, the assumption a police guy had about which people might show up. They said, well, a lot of chaotic, uh, violent uh, people will show up on the street and will destroy all windows and, and, and things like that, throw Molotov cocktails and so on. And the liberal left just, just accused those, this guy of saying, hey, this, uh, this assumption was wrong. No. It's a system, basically, which provides this kind of environment that this can happen at all, which is a problem. And the social liberal people don't really um, get what is really at stake at the moment. So if they go along with this kind of, this is again, this Christian Democratic Union in Hessen, which is the federal, which is the state where that happened, it's one of the most right-wing one. If those people get into power more and more, of course this will uh, lead to the fact that uh, democracy is really abandoned in the world. This year we did it again, and what they tried this year is they want not to happen at all these demonstrations. They just kettled the whole anti-capitalist block, the whole demonstration was anti-capitalist. We haven't seen that in years. Okay, we have always, we were always a few people now, ever, now really ordinary people follow the marches, not in large numbers, but enough as we believe. And we win the public discourse. And that's what they are afraid of. They oppose fear on the people by, um, by reconstructing the labor market. But they are afraid of the people by themselves that they stood up. And that more people will come. And to prevent that, of course, they produce this kind of police tactics. I know you deal in, in a different way in, in, you know, in uh, Greece uh, with the police. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I saw some pictures, oh, basically. How we feel then, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's totally <laughs> different. We did that in the 70s and in the 80s. <laughs> of many people might know that, I still know that we did the same. People, some comrades from mine did so. We can't do that anymore. People are so afraid of any kind of violence 
that you can't uh, smash, smash a window. You will disrupt the whole, the whole story. There's only one thing uh, which can bring us out of this crisis and out of this, uh, let's say, fear and this imposing by a government which basically wants, of course, nothing <coughs> but more money and nothing more than um, providing the environment for capitalism. And there's this transnational organization and transnational movement. And I think we will have a very long struggle. That internationalist movement, which came out of the 1968, basically is only no, only a glimpse of that. What happened? What 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 has what has it what had it been? There's so many people, although there's Facebook around and you can make friends with everybody, basically, all around the globe. Basically, it's the radical left which is not connected anymore in a very tight sense. If you speak to people and we organize uh, demonstrations in Germany where we say, we le let's make it a transnational movement, let's, make, let's bring every, as many people from Europe to, to, to Frankfurt, let's ha try to support them, pay the buses and so on. Let's bring the protest there where it belongs, to the European Central Bank mm -hmm. and to your, the European government or to Brussels, because they are the people in power. You will uh, ask around your comrades who could you can who could you call, and very few people have a telephone number in in their pocket of somebody uh, who's a comrade in uh, in another country. And we have to change that right now very quickly, and we have to form we have to form organizations, coalitions, which basically have. A common agenda, as you just said, as Syriza has already. We already have on our national level, let's say local levels, similar and common again agendas. I don't believe anymore in really kind of political parties like uh, having a Tsipras or somebody who is um, representing us all or, or uh, things like that. If it is really necessary, okay, for God's sake, then we have one of those guys. But we have to form a strong transnational organization which confronts capital at its full force by combining our local struggles we do and our local passion we put into and our local creativity to expand that what we do locally also to other things. So supporting an election in Greece from people who are in, in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy, in Germany, in France, and so on, and have the same common agenda. Supporting an election in Germany right now, for example. M some people believe after September uh, 2013, the coming election, some things will be different. I don't believe so. It's a, it's a Christian Democratic Union, which is still at 40%. It's ridiculous, but it's that way, because the Germans are full of fear. They just, <laughs> they're conservative right now. I mean, that's what they are. They are f fear that things will get worse for them. But imagine if we have a strong organization which can basically, which leads to the fact that we intervene in strongly in our so-called so national sovereignty. I mean, from below. I mean, not, not the way capital the capitalists does, but the way we intervene into our different societies, you know what I mean? Just start not a fight if we let's just a link when I want to finish that. The transnational movement is quite important and left forum is one of those things where um, at least uh, some of those issues can be addressed. Um, but the other issue is of course um, that the United States needs a strong left and yes as far as I can witness right now also very very much <laughs> is in peril here so um, we have a lot of work to do. It's I hope we don't get burned out by doing that, but um, yeah, this was just my, some words, sorry. Thank you. Bruno. Okay, um, yes, the, the, the title of my presentation is uh, Extortion and Death. 
reflections on the Italian catastrophe. Uh, but actually, except for, uh, for some remarks uh, uh, to follow immediately, I will not be speaking uh, specifically about the situation in Italy, but I will address more generally the debt and uh, or uh, extortion economy of the neoliberal regime of capital. Uh, and uh, in doing so, I will rely on uh, a recent important book uh, that I had just reviewed by uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, The Making of the Indebted Man. I want to start by recalling one of the most tragic in a series of tragic events uh, of the many cases of a suicide that had taken place, place uh, in Italy uh, and elsewhere in the last years. Early in April this year in uh, a small town in Italy, Civitanova Marche, there was a triple suicide. Romeo Dionisi of uh, 62 and uh, Anna Maria Sopranzi of uh, 68, husband and wife, hanged themselves after their pensions uh, disappeared. Uh, then uh, uh, Anna Maria's older brother, Giuseppe, who lived with them, uh, also took his life by throwing himself into the Adriatic Sea. The Daily News, to mention but one American media source, uh, had uh, an article about them, right, uh, which was titled, uh, one uh, once well-off uh, retired Italian couple, now destitute, commits suicide. That was, uh, that, that was the title. The article uh, explains that Romeo was one of Italy's many esodati. Esodati is translated as the exiled ones. And that is to say, the esodati are people whose retirement pension simply disappeared when uh, Italy raised the retirement age by five years as part of the austerity program. In, in other words, these people lost their job, right? They, 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 they retired, but they had no, no money, no pension. The couple, as well as Anna Maria's older brother, lived off of her small pension, which was not enough to survive with. The tragedy shocked Italy and uh, found uh, its useless, corrupt, and cynical political class speechless, probably having wasted all uh, words on countless useless occasions. Indeed, uh, these criminals, th they are the true criminals, rarely, if ever, pay the price for what they do, and to quote Akira Kurosawa's movie title, The Bed Sleep Well. The couple is described as once uh, well-off, a once well-off couple, now destitute, by the Daily News, uh, as uh, mired in financial troubles or uh, as uh, having economic difficulties by other news media. But one should ask, whose troubles and whose difficulties? Or better, what is their root cause? Uh, what or who is responsible for these troubles and difficulties? There were people who actually blamed the couple for not looking for help in a more uh, proactive way for being too proud. In a word, the victims are to be blamed once again. This tragic story, again, one of the way too many happening lately, and the way it was represented, misrepresented by the media, point to the logic of guilt, intimately connected to the logic of death. Instead of shutting down the country, reversing the murderous course of institutional politics, and financial capital, instead of abolishing the terrorist logic of uh, austerity, it simply provides, provided the occasion for a few institutional tears and for condemning the wrong choice of those who showed themselves too weak vis-a-vis -vis the challenges of the future. In truth, this is all false. The future precisely is destroyed by the terrorist logic of sovereign power. It is, uh, as Maurizio Lazzarato says in the book that I mentioned, the making of the indebted man, right? Uh, the, the future is preempted, and uh, the destruction of the future, that is the meaning of uh, the catastrophe, of the word catastrophe. In the making of the indebted man, Lazzarato says, I'm quoting, that the class struggle is today unfolding and uh, intensifying in Europe around the issue of debt. 
This is how the book's foreword starts. We then read about the subjective figure of the debtor. Who is a debtor? Lazzarato says everyone. Everyone is a debtor, he says, ac accountable to and guilty before capital. That was a quote. As, uh, a mur this is a murderous logic engulfing everyone's life to the point of total destitution and the tragic end uh, I spoke about above in relation to the Italian triple suicide. Lazzarato speaks of uh, a debtor-creditor struggle. This renewed class struggle, which is of course not confined to Europe, but is rather global, and uh, Lazzarato says that, this struggle that at times has a tragic end uh, is widespread and not limited to the visible categories of uh, productive uh, and uh, employed uh, uh, labor. Indeed, uh, I'm quoting from Lazzarato, uh, uh, within it, no distinction exists between uh, workers and uh, the unemployed, consumers and producers, working and uh, non-working populations, retirees uh, and uh, welfare recipients." End quote. Everyone is a debtor and capital is the universal creditor. Lazzarato makes the same point toward the end of the book when, when uh, he says, uh, I'm quoting again, debt surpasses the division between employment and uh, unemployment, working and uh, non-working, productive and uh, assisted, uh, precarious and non-precarious, end quote. Today we hear that in Europe alone, 20 million people are unemployed. It makes then uh, a lot of sense, as uh, Lazzarato suggests, to shift our attention from uh, labor and uh, employment. In fact, the coming struggles which entail a reinvention of uh, democracy, uh, again, uh, this is what Lazzarato, that's the phrase from, uh, from his book, go well beyond that. They reach into the substance of all existence as that the ugly face of a contemporary capital becomes existential debt. And that is to say, a real existential threat and uh, a path to death. Indeed, death is death. I hope that the pronunciation is uh, clear, right? Death and death, right? So, the new economy, a debt or uh, extortion economy, deprives people of uh, political power and, of course, <coughs> of wealth. It deprives them of, a, again, this is a quote, again, of the future that is of a time, time as decision making, choice and possibility, end quote. That, Lazzarato says, becomes something like the original sin, inherited. One is born in that, and through the process of constant evaluation and subjection, the subjectivity of the indebted man is constructed and projected to infinity. But whether the indebted man or woman is employed or unemployed, uh, precarious or non-precarious, and so on, there is always some work he or she must do in relation to and uh, on account of uh, the original debt, the infinite debt. One has to become an entrepreneur, and uh, in particular, Lazzarato says, uh, an entrepreneur of the self. Failure to do so, or uh, do so successfully, that's catastrophic. That's the catastrophe we saw at the outset of this paper, when uh, life ends tragically, when death is the only way out of death. And uh, what we have seen, the triple suicide in Italy, is uh, only a cipher of uh, right, a sign of a wider and global catastrophe. The examination of the figure of the entrepreneur, and in particular of the entrepreneur of the self, allows Lazzarato to engage in a poignant critique of uh, neoliberalism and to an extent of Foucault's understanding of it. Far from embracing the notion, as others have done, uh, that everyone has to become an entrepreneur, uh, as if this could be a path to liberation, Lazzarato shows that indeed this is precisely what the neoliberal economy, in this sense a subjective economy, for it produces subjectivity, demands from all of us. The figure of the entrepreneur, especially the entrepreneur of the self, right, uh, is the figure of the indebted man or woman and thus the opposite of uh, the subject of uh, liberation. <coughs> What characterizes the figure, uh, this figure is uh, infinite debt, 
And that means infinite work, infinite effort, and striving for the mere aim of uh, avoiding falling into bare life whose only horizon is death, rather than uh, happiness or uh, the good life, a life of death that ends only in uh, and with death. The politics of a uh, subjection typical of uh, the neoliberal economy has a biopolitical and thanatopolitical meaning from thanatos, death, right? <coughs> Namely, the right of uh, life and death, the power of the sovereign or a uh, disciplinary ki kind uh, claims over everybody. To be sure, this power is ultimately and essentially sovereign power linked one way or the other to the sovereign paradigm. We are seeing this in Turkey right now with the protests and uh, the state, uh, the brutal state repression that started uh, last May. But uh, this May, but it, it is uh, the power that also includes the moral and legal injunction to labor, right? Uh, uh, to work on the self, Lazzarato says. This is very similar to Foucault's notion of a doso or uh, obedient bodies, the bodies that are both subjected and uh, one way or the other must be productive, a kind of a self-torture, says Lazzarato with a reference to Nietzsche. Uh, obedience and docility are about ways to behave in the future, especially when the future is made uh, impossible. The condition of a uh, precarity is where the notion of uh, the entrepreneur of the self uh, can be clearly grasp, grasp, uh, grasped. Uh, and the Italian esodati, right, remember the exiled ones, are a, a very clear category in that sense, but so are undocumented workers everywhere and those working and living under true conditions of uh, slavery. The question of the future, in particular of uh, the, con the control of the future and the annihilation of the possible, is linked to the question of uh, security. The logic of security, this obsession that we have with security, which is today's uh, the main uh, ideological justification for the system's use and abuse of, of uh, power against everybody, and which is responsible for total human insecurity. I say today, but I should perhaps say ever, ever since Hobbes. The logic of security gives rise to the most thorough and powerful application of the mode of debt, existential debt, which includes the prison. <coughs> this happens, according to Lazzarato, through a type of control based on a constant evaluation. What is evaluated is not only, I'm quoting, the skills and the know-how of the worker, but also the poor man's action, actions in a society, that is to say, his lifestyle, his social behavior, his value, his very existence, end quote. What we, especially in uh, U.S. cities, experience as racial profiling, right, the odious stop and frisk law in New York City, for instance, is the direct result of the logic of security and debt of uh, the constant evaluation of us sections of the population and the curtailment of time and space, the curtailment of the healthy indeterminacy of the possible. With the debt or uh, extortion economy, the objective and subjective moments, sovereign and uh, existential debt, labor and action, work and life, are all determined and uh, commanded, uh, that's Marx's word, quoted by Lazzarato, by the formula of uh, capital, the formula M, M prime, right, which is money, more money. Right, that, the, the, that's the surplus value, the, 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 the prime, more money. It, it's made a spiraling motion which preempts the future and posits the conditions for infinite debt. Money as capital, M, M prime, destroys time and it destroys life. Everyday life for each person, each singularity and subject is reduced uh, to constant work, constant work on the self, and this distorts <coughs> and destroys the self's <coughs> genuine uh, possibilities, its alternatives, by reducing everything to the formula of money itself, a flat uniformity, a dead-end street to docility, and uh, the university of uh, production. What becomes a commodity? 
invested by the power relations of uh, money as capital, money as debt, is no longer simply a person's labor power, the time of labor, but all power and all time. It is life itself, which is now indistinguishable from work, and it is now indistinguishable from death. Indeed, the life of the indebted man or woman is the same as death. This becomes most evident when that becomes social, as uh, ca a category that Lazzarato borrows from Foucault. Social debt happens when uh, the prison extends to society as a whole, when uh, the chains of slavery are everywhere, and society no longer has uh, any autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the state, but is the product of uh, techniques of government uh, as well as the field of action of the police. Again, uh, let's think about Turkey these days, uh, um, but many other places in the world, including, of course, uh, the, the police in uh, New York City and in any other global city. Uh, this is when that the prison of debt is extended to the social as a whole, the injunction to constantly work and work on the self to become, uh, Lazzarato says, uh, to become one's own boss, right? shifts to society the costs and risks of a business and uh, the state. In other words, one is on uh, his her own. A war of everybody against uh, uh, everybody, you know, which uh, with the complication of uh, a common power that keeps ev everybody in awe, uh, that keeps everybody in fear and uh, terror. So the interesting thing is that uh, what for Hobbes is an either or, a state of nature or a state of political society, we have both of them together. This is the neoliberal system which has uh, precisely combined the two conditions described by Hobbes, the natural condition, the state of nature, the political condition, the state, the state, the condition of uh, a frightening sovereign power. The elimination of the future is the elimination of a uh, desire. And uh, the elimination of a uh, desire is, uh, Hobbes says, uh, the same as death. It really becomes a question of life and death as the tragic illustration I gave at the outset of this paper clearly shows it is a struggle against death that must be waged. <coughs> Indeed, yes, there is an enemy, and it must be vanquished. Thank you, Bruno. Carlos. OK. Um, <coughs> I, I have tried to address here the, to provide a portrait for you of what is the current situation in, Sp in Spain as far as the struggles. It's a big word to put, hmm, are concerned. I'm not going to give you any figure of the catastrophe because, among other things, we are still addressing these problems with the standard figures of, you know, of the dismal science of, of economics. And perhaps this is not uh, what we should be doing. Anyway, so uh, my intention is to share here with you some reflections I have tried to do regarding the struggles. I insist it's a big word, not always appropriate for what is going on, neither in Spain nor in Europe, nor for that matter in the US. So the problem I pose is how is it that the machineries of privatization, expropriation, and plunder continue to work as if nothing but what's happening, despite the, in some cases, relatively continuous mobilization, strikes, and demonstrations, these machineries go on working as if nothing was happening. Now, that we live, we are ruled by an oligarchy, and that an oligarchy, unless it has some fear of some other power, is a criminal class, this is obvious and should be obvious to you. Machiavelli was the first one who explained that, that we are ruled by criminal men who have been given by the Christian religion the world in prey. And we are taught by the Christian religion to endure the beatings. So how is it that these machineries continue to work as if nothing? And they continue expropriating, appropriating, 
privatizing everything, water, health, education, the forest, the rivers, natural resources, everything, absolutely everything. So this is the question I try to pose. I don't have an answer to this question. I have some thoughts to share with you. So first of all, in, 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 in Spain, the struggles started with the 15M, 15 of May movement, also called as the Indignados, in 2011. Now, just some brief words about that. This movement was highly problematic because it was amazingly apolitical and anti-political. I'm going to give you just an example, a case that we went through. You remember, Peter, when we were in Manchester? In those days, in May 2011, Peter was still in Manchester. Me too, I'm still there. And we were rallying the Greeks and the Spaniards who were there rallying in, in a square there in Manchester. And some people came, Greeks and Spaniards, from other cities around. And I saw there a bunch of Spaniards, quite young, 19, 18, 20, with a big, um, a big label there and saying, the, we are the best prepared, the most skilled generation, but the less value generation. And I was so shocked by that that I went to talk to them, a bit angry, I have to say, and say, do you really believe what you say here? So you think you are more prepared than your grandparents that fought with the Republic? Do you really believe that? Because you have some, excuse me, fucking technical skills, you are more prepared, I can't see you, you are not prepared at all. Obviously they were very pissed off. You say, you know, you, and I, uh, I think some of them got the point because I reminded them or the generation of their grandparents many of whom probably fought in favor of the Republic. Those people were well prepared, among other things, because there was an amazing uh, popular education movement during the Spanish Republic, which is, I mean, we should capitalize on it and in many other things, but obviously uh, the system is very successful in you know, silencing the important things. So the, the indignados movement, very problematic, very problematic, very politically correct. In reality, what they want is that I want my part of the cake. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's that. And highly problematic. I think this example I gave you says it all. Now, there is also now going on since more than one year ago the anti evictions movement or the stop evictions movement, which is an important, perhaps in some respects, the most important one. They have managed to <coughs> gather almost 200 signatures to put forward legislation in Parliament which is compulsory to accept for debate, but of course it's not compulsory afterwards what happens after the, the debate. At least they managed to, for the Parliament to have to discuss or to pass this uh, popular initiative. In addition to that, which was symbolically quite significant, they do what they call in Spain and in Argentina, which is where um, where they come from, scratches. Scratches are a sort of public exposure of the criminals, or those who collaborate with the criminals. MPs who do not vote in favor of this legislation and continue to vote in favor of protecting the banks. So they go to the places where they live, and they do in a totally peaceful way, and they have developed quite a whole methodology of peaceful uh, uh, and they go and try to expose publicly, uh, basically MPs. Now they are sitting and they targeting bankers as well. Mm. But uh, so this the the, the anti evictions movement has have so far these two aspects to it. It's probably uh, the most important movement that has taken place recently in Spain. There is also another movement which is it has a funny name in in, in Spain, but it's a movement of retired people, elderly people, who are, uh, let's say, a little bit, who feel concerned, who, 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 and they are retired, they have time, and they practice uh, civil disobedience, and, uh, and they, they undertake quite good actions in different places in, in, in Spain. <coughs> so they, I think they, they, it's worth mentioning there as well. There is also uh, something which is called the mareas, the tides. There are tides, big tides, i explain in a moment what it means roughly, in education. Uh, they have been quite strong in Madrid, those one. In education and healthcare, above all. In other 
economic areas of sectors as well. They consist of basically, well, in Madrid they have been striking since November uh, for, for, for weeks, for weeks, and big demonstrations and different kinds of performances during the demonstrations. Right? I will comment in a, in a moment because one of the problems of, the, of these uh, actions is the too festive and politically correct character and uh, not enough militant, not militant enough. But the, uh, the mareas, the tides, in Madrid in particular, in other parts of Spain, but in Madrid in particular, because in Madrid the neoliberal program is being applied with a, a vicious uh, attempt. Um, so they, they have their importance. But again, we got this ties split by economic sector, mm -hmm. which is one of the problems of all the things that are going on there. There is also a, a union, the Agricultural Workers' Union in Andalusia, and those are militant. Those are militant. And normally they are undertake actions which uh, annoy a lot in the powers in place. They occupy lands, because in Andalusia land is still, you know, it's a, a huge land owning capitalist there. And they also occupy supermarkets and provide themselves with the, with the, I mean, they, they, they practice what in bourgeois ideology is thief. Thief is what we do, not what they do, of course. Um, uh, and there have been some general strikes um, whose following has been significant, but not that significant. By contrast, the demonstrations which normally take place every day that there is a general strike, they are Quite, they have been quite well attended, let's say. But they were, again, very festive, uh, well-meaning uh, demonstrations. And um, so it was somehow, very often I got the impression that people feel themselves, well, I've done my bit. Yeah, now, so th this is the last thing I wanted to, to comment. The, the, there have been, I don't remember, I haven't done the counting, I think three general strikes in the last, in the last year. Mm. There, there are also attempts that, well, lately, the, mm, the most new thing I saw is the talk in connection with the visit of uh, Alexis Tsipras to, to Madrid, a uh, talk of a European front, a, a European, I don't mean a popular front, uh, it could be, why not, but uh, I mean by front I mean it in a more neut neutral sense. The left, the union of the left, at the very least in Southern Europe, and of course it will be highly desirable with the German involved, of course, with the, the German left involved. This is new as far as I am concerned. The talk of that is talk, but the left is totally split into pieces. You know, it's just pathetic to, to, to see it, except in Greece, thanks to Syriza for the, for the moment. Mm -hmm. So those are uh, basically the, the, I mean, the uh, brief rough picture of, of the struggles. Of course, I don't need to tell you, just mention that the response of the, of the state and of the government and the, of, the, of the oligarchy through their servants is, uh, is terrible. Repression is, becomes heavier and heavier. Criminalization becomes more and more vicious. New legislation is put in place. And I think we are seeing it everywhere. And anyway, this is not just now has happened historically whenever uh, there are problems. Uh, it is high time, I think, that we start to question the so-called democracy, this bourgeois democracy, which uh, is, um, you know, but I, I think we need to question it. Intellectually, to question it radically. Another matter is how strategically we act in accordance with that, because we should not be stupid. It might be one of the good things of Syriza. Uh, I commented it yesterday in another panel of Machiavelli. Syriza and some left-wing governments in Latin America is that they are trying, they are trying to pursue the cause without delusions, you know. And perhaps being revolutionary today is about that. Not about, you know, practicing this easygoing talk of revolution. Revolutions are not spoken of. They are done. And perhaps to do the revolution today, it means to be very careful and not to fall into delusions and to try to. But anyway, this is another, another part of, a, of another discussion. So as you, in my view, all these struggles, so-called, and I insist that the struggle is too big a war for many of the things going on, because people are too politically correct. People are full of fear. Of course, and unless the struggles 
come together and the split into two of politics occurs so that the people or call them however you want on the one side and the criminals on the other so the oligarchy on the other unless this happens and unless the struggles become more militant whatever militantism means that will have to be discovered through a political praxis rather than by dogmatic you know sanctions mm, preconceived dogmatic sanctions well th this is one of the things about cities in my view that is something new uh, our, our colleague there, yes, he was commented that in part this uh, emerged spontaneously, in part, of course. All revolutions have emerged spontaneously, in part. All re by, and this is one of the good things. So, so without preconceived uh, revolutionary uh, or, or, or without the, the pro professional revolutionary, who is the one who lives off talking about revolution when no risk, for example, here I could talk about revolution. I don't rank any risk. But perhaps I go back at the university and to my students, I flatter them, as they want me to do, instead of risking with them, that they might give me bad feedback and challenging them. You know. So uh, basically, this is, uh, so, uh, the situation, in my view, is, is, is very bad, because we don't, I don't see a set series in Europe. I don't see things coming to go together. And the occasion is there. If we talk in Machiavelli's term, the occasion is there because the discontent is massive, massive. Syriza proof, among other things, that you provide an orientation. Because Syriza, after all, it was, is, is the, bo the voice of reason in Greece and in Europe today. You know, far from being the stream part, is the voice of reason, providing an orientation for the people. So to channel this discontent and start to build and... Uh, Anyway, this is it. It's just to share some, with you some, some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. We have about half an hour for discussions and, de and debates. People, of course, can ask questions, make some comments. Try to be, yes, not too long. Make it uh, uh, compact, brief questions and comments. Yes. There is one there as well. We'll start from uh, there. I would we'll like to uh, uh, first uh, say that it was very refreshing for me to hear uh, some voice of reason coming out of Germany. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Having, been, yeah. having uh, lived through the terror of occupied Greece during the Second World War, uh, I didn't expect that, and that's why I guess I was surprised, and I was pleasantly surprised from what ha happened in Frankfurt uh, recently with the, 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 the organized uh, a protest. Uh, relative to that, of course, I want to say that is, you, you, everybody spoke about fear, but I think that is a, a globalization of terrorism that is going on. And we are still talking about fear. There's a terror going on and being supported by drones and other <coughs> killings that uh, have been ignored. And uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Carlos said, "What is needed? Uh, what, what is the uh, is needed is perhaps a, a unification of, of these efforts in Europe, just like there is a, 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 a unification of the globalization of terror all over the world, not only in Europe but globally. There is a, a globalization of terror. So we, you know, let's not fall into the fear, into the thing of just using words." That, like we said before, the Second World War, they say workers uh, of the world unite. And what happened? The multi, uh, multi uh, companies ended up, and it was the capitalists that united, not the workers. So, uh, you know, I think the cities that should be taken seriously on uh, this proposal. And uh, we should try to think of bringing all the left of the whole Europe together if they have to counteract the globalization of terror. Thank you. I would like to ask uh, each of the <coughs> panel speakers if they know uh, what percentage of uh, the working people are unionized in the corresponding countries. Because, uh, to my opinion, <coughs> what we really live is an attack of the corporate capital to the working uh, people of uh, Europe, Southern Europe more intensively, and internationally. Uh, so, what is the degree of the organization of the working class uh, around Europe? 
and uh, uh, what are the real possibilities to organize uh, the working uh, uh, European class in a united front, a front that uh, will really go beyond uh, this uh, capitalist uh, barbarism that uh, we live and we are going to live without uh, affecting uh, local uh, struggles, uh, what is the perspective? In particular in Germany, uh, I would like also to get an answer, uh, what is the, uh, the, the left forces there, the spectrum of the left forces, and uh, uh, likewise <coughs> in Italy, because I know in Greece there is a strong left in general, traditionally. Mm -hmm. We collect a few questions, right? We address them. Yes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Could somebody from Teresa, if you know, what, what is the policy with regard to leaving the euro and, and readapting the, the drachma? Is that part of the policy? And if that is, what are some of the downsides? Um, and and what, what is the response to that? Okay. Yes. Uh, this uh, question for, for uh, about Spain specifically. Um, given uh, it's like okay, in in Spain, like what 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 are the uh, prospects for for left wing organization in Spain? Like I know about the the Communist Party and the United Left, and uh, I'm wondering if like I, I mean, given what the the Communist Party and their their um, their role in the in the creation of the current Spanish Constitution. And in the transition uh, after the dictatorship, I mean, are they a lost cause, or do we need in Spain some sort of a um, like a, a new party, like the Spanish equivalent of Syriza, or, or something along those lines? Is the Communist Party um, relevant anymore in, in the in the struggle in Spain? <coughs> Uh, yes, so I also wanted to ask the panelists, the non-Greek panelists uh, uh, from the, um, uh, I I here, uh, what <coughs> were uh, the exact reasons that, for example, the electorate didn't choose left forces in their respective uh, elections? In Germany, I understand SPD was the one that imposed austerity earlier, much earlier, before it became an issue in the rest of Europe. But then people chose the Christian Democrats in the elections. The same in Spain. In, this, in Spain, uh, right as the crisis was bubbling up, the people chose the right. Now, did, they didn't even go further left than the socialists, which we know in Europe they are not even to the left. Right? So uh, what, what are the reasons? Is this the lack that, that you said, that the fear? What fear? I mean, is it perhaps the way that the left in the rest of Europe, not in Greece, is not being, uh, uh, is not reaching out to the people, or is not organized enough? Is it the problem of the lack of labor unions that has it has disintegrated? What what do we say? I think we have enough maybe for a first round of responses. Uh, I'm not sure what the percentage of people being unionized in Greece is, and if anyone here wants to contribute that knowledge. Yes. It's very low. Okay, great. Uh, but uh, still, I don't think here the, this is the only question. Sorry? It's even less than that. It's even less than that. But okay. one has to consider the whole social division of labor, how many, uh, the percentage are very small compared to other European countries, the percentage of wage earners in Greece, and all the changes in the labor market, uh, the recent labor market, but he's the expert, not me. No, no, that's, that's both what you was see. the percentage? 22. 22. Even, even or even less than that. However, I see that this is not just a question of numbers, as important they are, but uh, the relationship between uh, what we would call the base and those who represent them. Uh, the recent uh, attempt for a strike in, uh, with the teachers in Greece, I think, was a very, very good example of that. Uh, either miscommunication, if we want to put it in a more politically correct way, or uh, rather problematic. Those representing the unions not really uh, being 
as I sort of alluded to that like earlier, on the side of the, the people, but most often working for you know, uh, the governments or the system itself. Uh, so I think this is what has to be problematized and this is what it has to be challenged. Uh, also what I briefly discussed, uh, I think uh, the January strike with the metro workers, uh, I think there was a, the, there was a good case there of uh, challenging that relationship. Uh, so the unions, uh, <coughs> the same way like other parts of uh, society where this relationship between uh, represented uh, and represented is rather uh, uh, problematic here. And this is what we have to, to work, I think. Now the question of, should I try to answer the next question or you want to gather answers for it? No, no, yeah, yeah. You just answer okay, okay. what you feel like answering. Uh, with answer regard everything. to the short, short. Uh, with regard to Euro and the question of uh, exiting the great Brexit or anything, like it has created a very, very intense uh, discussion, uh, especially within Syriza. I mean, whole Greek society, but Syriza as well, uh, and it's a very contentious issue still. Uh, Syriza itself has decided that would not like to engage in this discussion, or the majority of the party, okay, uh, or that is not the main issue, to which I agree. It's not the main issue, it's not that alone, because it's a, it's a system, it's a whole bunch of policies or planning that has to be uh, around that. Or, But on the other side, I really believe that if you want to have like a complete like a discussion and about the open possibility here that the negotiations that Syriza wants to engage to might not go as we would like, there should be an open and public discussion about how it would be handled. But that's my personal take on the story. Um, I mean, as a radical left, I, um, we are we were not so much, as I said, uh, involved in those fights. But I'm a bit aware of these things that you know that it's not. Mere, it's also the case. I think is it really important how much people are unionized? This is a question we have really to think of right now. It's about seven million people of the German workforce were unionized. So that is from 22 million people who basically can go to work or to go to work, it's medium roughly 20%. But it's a trade union which is part of, at least for a very long time, of the whole capitalist structure. So it was the Social Democratic Party in alliance with the DGB people basically reformed the labor market, which actually results in that kind of crisis which we see. They said the problem is that the work, the unemployed people do not really get the right service from the authorities to find jobs. It's a problem of Vermittlung, as I say, of, of bringing, let's say, the jobs and the people together. That was their main agenda. The hegemonic view of the, of the uh, um, um, DGB and others is still work, 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 work. And under every condition, okay? And this is basically also reflects a little bit what's, what's uh, going on. If this is the main picture, work, 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 my uh, wife is sitting here. Yeah, his father is from Greek. He recently visited us, and he said again, "What's the problem with the German?" He <laughs> migrated uh, to Germany from Greece uh, somewhere 30, 30, 40 years ago. The problem with the Germans is you only have work, work, work in your head. It's only work, and that's it. And if you have the problem of the kind of capitalist restructuring going on, throwing people out of work because it's the way capitalism works. We, we try to make some make things more smoothly. We try to make it with less work than, let's say, more. I mean, the living labor uh, is basically also reduced because, well, everybody is a little bit lazy, right? So 
So we try to make the things better. So we all contribute basically to this kind of discussion. But if you have this kind of ideology, this is about work, 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 and it's, this is related, of course, also to wages, and you then say, well, if you can't find work, you lay you off and it's your thing how you do it. Then you produce this kind of fear which actually is, as a uh, uh, comrade said, globalized also through other means in that, in that sense by threatening um, with drones and saying if you don't behave quite right, uh, we take you out. But um, That's why we're like Manhattan. The buildings are too tall <laughs> for the drones. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I don't believe really that. Yeah, well, could maybe Occupy Wall Street will make the shift, but I don't know really. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, why you know Cohen laid out the strategy: first Manhattan, then Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The state of the left is the is since 2007 basically there's a reunification going on. Okay, not on the alliance between trade unions, the old traditional left, but the let's say, things which fall into peril after 68, so that everybody wanted to be a small party guy and uh, we formed all our collectives and different forms of, let's say, communist or anarchist alternative uh, small struggle units, um, they come together again. That's a big thing, okay? Since a couple of years, uh, they come together. And as we believe in in more autonomy, of course, we also have our problems with unifying ourselves under one big political program. Okay, so <coughs> um, that's going to happen right now. Make a yeah, that's just, of course. I mean, the left party, uh, the Linke, is uh, is a fr is um, is basically, of course, um, a thing which is a fraction of different. Um, uh, parts, let's say, different uh, ideologies, different kinds of views, <coughs> different kinds of tactics, <coughs> strategies, and so on. It's not the way Syriza is working at all, I mean, but for example, I am part of the interventionist left. We are a very strong, I would say, communist movement if it comes to organizing mass civil disobedient actions on the street. So if you see uh, demonstrations against Nazis in Dresden or against uh, um, the G8 2007 and so on, or now in Blockupy, you can be assured that our group is basically a core of this kind of um, moving the people on the street and um, make some tricks with the police that we get there where we want to go. We are in strong alliance with the party. But because of the, let's say, still prevailing belief in the radical left that the political party is not part of the solution but part of the problem, um, we don't unite right now. Because we still believe the more, the more thing which is more important is that it has to be a transnational thing, otherwise it makes no sense at all. And that's the thing what I believe from the Zerisa too, I mean. It's a pity of the thing is they, if they got into power alone in, uh, in, in Greece, they, they might destroy uh, a left uh, promise. <laughs> Bruno. Yeah. Maybe I can uh, start by addressing the question of uh, fear terror. And, and terror, the question of, uh, and also the, the question that you posed especially, uh, the, the, the fear terror question and uh, uh, the search for a unified moment that, yes, I agree, must be something transnational. But it's interesting, for example, to look at uh, what's happening in Turkey, what just started a few weeks ago. Uh, that the unifying moment uh, just just happened, you know, all of a sudden, that probably uh, not, not many people, I believe, expected that, even in Turkey itself. I mean, how uh, Erdogan was able actually to become this, uh, you know, unifying moment or the trees uh, in uh, Gezi Park in uh, Taksim Square. Uh, so th certainly the unifying moment uh, will uh, happen and the, I, I completely agree that it is important to look at this uh, in uh, a global way and that the, the question of uh, the global war against everybody because this, the, the, the drones are not only, uh, I mean certainly the main victims are the children in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and so on. But it is uh, exactly a war against everybody. 
I mean, uh, because uh, the, the idea is to create this culture of fear and terror, which uh, ultimately keeps uh, many people away from uh, probably becoming uh, really aware of uh, the, the importance of finding uh, and building alternatives. I, I don't know if I think about Italy, I mean, as far as I see, uh, and to, to address some other questions too, I believe that things like the institutional left, right, uh, the, the institutional parties of the left are as useless as all the other parties. I mean, certainly there are people, very radical people in Italy who do very uh, good, important work, but around what? Around what precisely divides societies globally? I mean, the international qu question of uh, migration, for example. I mean, the globalization of uh, the exploitation of uh, labor in, uh, you know, the, the most, I mean, I, again, which is not exploited only uh, in uh, uh, the, 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 the countries of uh, the global south, but uh, of course there is this, uh, in Italy, uh, for example, I mean, as far as I see, uh, that that is something that uh, certainly may keep many people away from uh, engaging in a real struggle. The fact that uh, although, uh, and uh, many things remain a mystery for me uh, in Italy, uh, the, the situation of Italy, but the fact that ultimately even those who perhaps are unemployed uh, in Italy, who lost their job, uh, they are always better off than uh, the many people traveling to Italy from uh, 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 North Africa and through North Africa, Africa even from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, from uh, you know all countries in the, in the world, from uh, uh, East Asia and so on. So I think that this is a very important moment. Actually, I was wondering when, uh, uh, Marx, you, you spoke about people in Germany making one da one euro per hour, uh, and I, I, I want, uh, I mean, you, you meant uh, immigrants uh, uh, or, uh, or uh, um, people? Unemployed people are forced, unemployed, are, to, are forced to, to do those. To do, uh, yeah, to work, yeah. So, I mean, uh, I think that this is, that uh, I don't know if that was, uh, but uh, that th these things are all uh, uh, interconnected, and uh, certainly people had to become aware that there is a, uh, a global uh, war of uh, what you would say the oligarchy of uh, this uh, you know class uh, yeah, the, you know the the the, uh, the one percent as the occupy movement uh, uh, right, rightly said uh, that, that, that there is uh, a threat uh, globally uh, and of course they are able to organize better than uh, than others also because we had this uh, immediacy of uh, the state uh, police uh, repression which is always brutal and. Uh, so, but, but that, that's what the, that's why they are brutal because they know that something is uh, happening. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe you want to continue. Uh, I mean, I'm. No, I don't want to continue. I want to say something different. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. No, no, continue. I mean, uh, continue yeah. the answering. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let me let me tell the compañero, the Greek companion there. Uh, the percentage of unionization uh, that's of no consequence, my friend. That's of no consequence at all. The unions, and I know the unions in Spain, in AF, in France, and in England, and have some notions in other, but the unions and the left, and now I'm talking about the left on Spain because it's a similar situation, they are totally petrified institutions, totally petrified. They are part of the system. Listen, do not misunderstand me. I don't mean that all the militants of these organizations are bad people. No. The organizations are totally petrified. They are living out of the system. And you can see their leaders, if we analyze them politically as we should, try to hold on to some things within the system and in favor of the system. The, so the union is totally useless. A fundamental constraint for the struggle to take a step further. A fundamental constraint are the unions. I have no doubts about that. And I, we could undertake an analysis of what they do and say on an everyday basis, and you will see it. Because it's so clear. What is amazing is that people don't see it. The united left in Spain, and um, the many lefts in, in Spain, but the united left, which is the most prominent, because it's also a parliamentary party, is actually like the unions. A totally petrified organization. Totally petrified. They don't have ideas. They run after other movements and groups just to, you know, to gain some legitimacy and support. Actually, the United Left, Izquierda Unida, had councillors in all the banks in Spain. 
and they were getting lots of money, lots of, with the agreement of the organization of the parties, a percentage for the party, a percentage for you. So what are we talking about here? Totally petrified organizations, and totally new organizations are needed on the left, and this, we, at this stage, after how many years had we um, been under the so-called crisis, I would have thought that we, we were clear about that already, you know, because they are totally, they are fundamental barrier for something to happen, a fundamental barrier. They are living out of the system. All what they do is trying to hold on to the things that they have. And if there is some more radical attempt at the uh, <coughs> more general strikes of what they will always try to pacify, to pacify. Petrified institutions. Totally petrified. That's my view. Anyway. What is the composition of the United? Which parties? What is the Communist Party? The famous? The Communist Party is, is gone. The Communist Party is gone. It's, it's, it's a variety of uh, currents of the left which have their own history. Is it part of the United States? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, we have a next round of questions and comments. One, okay. two, uh, three, four. Many Americans have looked at Europe and seen greater access to health care, affordable higher ed, stronger unions, more vacation time, guaranteed government pensions, etc. Um, is what we're finally seeing uh, the victory of an American capitalist model uh, in Europe as well as in the United States? Yeah, I think fear is pretty much the, the word that most people in this in the city as well as the entire world is pretty much um, trapped into, you know, into, into the mines and, and so forth. So um, my question is this, since, since we're talking about strategy, how can you um, unfear the masses rather than being religious? Me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, at the height of the Russian crisis in 1917, Lenin wrote a pamphlet called The Threatening Catastrophe and How to Fight It. Um, now, it seems to me uh, that there is a crisis in Europe, but if you were to attack that crisis uh, by, uh, uh, by um, cancelling the debt, uh, but then uh, we, uh, countries would run out of foreign exchange immediately, and uh, they would have to stop borrowing money and society would, and society, say, of Greece and Spain would stop functioning, even to the minimal extent that they're functioning now. Um, so that any left uh, that proposes canceling the debt uh, <coughs> would, have to, would have to come up uh, with a program uh, uh, under which they could reorganize society and convince the people that this was a real possibility. So my um, question to you is, what would such a program involve? Yes. Um, well, first I want to second the recommendation of that pamphlet, the impending crisis, catastrophe, whatever by Lenin, uh, which I dredged up the moment the economic crisis hit. It's very relevant today. Obviously, it has to be adapted to national and international circumstances today. To do such an adaptation, you need a revolutionary party to discuss strategy and tactics. I feel almost all of the panelists did a great job of pinpointing very specific social problems um, very specific problems with organization and politics of the fight back. To, to centralize those on an international level, as the German comrade did, we need a party to help us collectively decide where to take that discussion. Finally, I'll just say that um, I was surprised and, and disheartened to hear the description of the book about debt. I thought that we in the U.S. were the only ones suffering from uh, that problem of, of misleading books about debt, and I'm referring to David Graeber's book, which makes an obsession, a, a, a fetish of debt um, over and above every other social, historical, political, cultural <laughs> question that has ever come up. And the sooner we grapple with that insanity and put it to rest, the better. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, to make a small comment that has to do with the two days that I'm following these uh, panels here. I'm not, I, I cannot share this, uh, euphoria and this enthusiasm about about Greece. And I think we, we have to be brutally honest here with, with ourselves. After the, uh, after the June last year's elections, um, the left collectively had 35% uh, almost in Greece, which is a percentage they've never seen before. And yet, throughout this year, 
it was not able to stop not even one single measure from the package of the austerity measures and the memorandum. So we're not, this is a paradox that needs to be explained. Actually, Greece has to be explained, not the rest of the countries. <laughs> that, that, I think, is the big, uh, the big problem. And, and, and the last comrade said the, uh, said the question, but then, disappointingly enough for me, at the end, he said the hope is that, uh, that Syriza gets into, into government. In Greece, the situation is not a tide of strikes and struggles that will lead uh, to, to elect the government. That's not the picture at all. So this needs to be discussed, I think, uh, deeper. For example, in Germany, 20 years ago, you could have a strike, I, I think, and then like, as the industry is strong, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, you, you blackmail the bosses and they will give you something. That's part of the power of the union. Can you do this now? You cannot. In any, in any industry, when you stop the strike, like the steel workers in Greece, they will say, thank you very much. That's what, exactly what we needed. It's a price of over, over production. Where are we going? That's the question. One last comment. Yes, one last comment, and then we have very brief responses, because the clock is ticking. Yeah. Well, it appears to me that the real problem is there is no theoretical roadmap that the left has developed. This is a, one of the grand uh, crises of capitalism. We really have no answer. And that's really something that we ought to seriously consider. And our academics will, will really go to work on this. Yeah, we try. No, let's No, things are changing. Right. Yeah. So very quick. Very right. quick responses because the, the clock is ticking and there Can are another, from this another side panel. Now, Peter? Huh? Can you start from this side? Now? Yes, okay. Yeah, <coughs> yeah go ahead. I, I need That's to fine. do something. I, I will be do very something. brief as before. Uh, no, I mean, you are talking, you are saying PASOK is the left? I, I don't understand. But anyway, I was not advocating anything. Whatever the responses are, have to be found out politically through a political process. This is what I have always said. Now, the importance of, let's call it, mobilization of different forms. In, the co in a context in which you have something like Syriza, in my view, is fundamental because Syriza is also a parliamentary and perhaps above all, a parliamentary party. How can you prevent parliamentarization from, you know, absorbing Syriza and forgetting about the whole thing? And what is interesting for me now, what is going on in Greece in relation to Syriza, is still these tensions are being played out there. And these tensions are fundamental because can be, they can be highly creative in the sense of bringing about uh, new forms, new, new, new things. If you are saying that we, or me in particular, I have, uh, no, I, I think I have a very realistic attitude. And I have some active hope. I explained yesterday in a, another panel what active hope is. An active hope is, an, is a militant hope. It's not the hope of passively waiting for something to happen. An active hope. And Syriza, I have no doubts, is the best that the left in Europe has had for quite many years. Now, it will end up in nothing. Well, that the, seems to be the fate of the left, but let's struggle in order to avoid it. Bruno. Yeah, maybe I'll uh, address the question of fear again uh, that you, you had, right? The question of what to do in, uh, to, to alter, right? The, the fear, yeah, right? How do you discuss, how do you have fear? And um, fear, analysis? right, right. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we, right, we don't have much time, so I just say one word. Education is certainly one of the most important uh, tools at our disposal. So I, don't, I, I mean, I can think for myself, teaching is uh, a way in which I, you know, from my, uh, uh, I can contribute a, a little, and I guess, you know, many people do the same or similar things. I mean, education is important, and also because I emphasize the question of the prison extended to all society, and uh, the association I make is to what uh, actually Angela Davis once said, uh, you know, education, not incarceration, right, we, which is uh, a way of uh, really uh, exiting uh, the idea, the, the, the culture of fear, which is being constructed uh, where the prison is uh, virtually everywhere. And uh, I don't believe that uh, the emphasis on the question of that is too uh, much. I mean, that understood in an e existential sense means that uh, 
very often uh, we realize that we don't own our existences, our own bodies, our, uh, we lease them. And one example of this, is, you know, a, a, an example of the prison as well, is, uh, you know, when we are, say, at the airport, kidnapped, really, by, uh, by uh, power, by the system. But we are always, uh, in a sense, in a state of being uh, kidnapped, uh, in a state, I mean, there is very little freedom ultimately, right? And so this, this is what creates this culture of fear. How to exit that, again, uh, is first of all to become aware that this is the case to educate ourselves. Marcus. I think to unfear the masses, there are two possibilities. I mean, as an individual, um, you, you would flee from those which basically causes fear. You would run away. Many people do that. They migrate f uh, all around the globe right now. They just flee because of the devastating situations where they are in, and they are also full of fear. The other things what humans do, usually in situations full of fear, they stick together. They put their heads together, they try to cover themselves, they try to help themselves in order to overcome fear and to build something stronger which basically con confront the beast which is in front of you. So this is what we said here. I, again, it's to stick together. We need to form a, a mass political movement and then, and then, uh, and, and, and then, and then uh, organization which basically of a new, which is of a new kind, which fosters this kind of struggles, which helps ourselves in this situation of fear and individualization, of struggling in everyday life, to do this kind of work of educating, of course, the people and of doing a good thing of theory, of radical imagination, of giving us time and a certain, uh, to, to have a certain analysis, giving us time to discuss certain issues. But I think to do all that, a little bit of religious moment is necessary. We really have to believe in something. And this is a religious thing. We have to believe in something. Can we and have we unreligious beliefs? <laughs> of course it's an unreligious <laughs> belief. If you believe in a communist society, it's an unreligious belief. But you have to believe. I mean, if without that, um, I think there will but not belief be... Belief is not the monopoly of religion. <laughs> no. Nesrina. Um, a brief comment to the question whether we're actually experiencing an Americanization of Europe via capitalism, of course, and the financialization of life. The, I think the answer is very straightforward and simple. It's yes, uh, and we can uh, we can mention many many examples. Direct communication on the level of uh, implementing that financialization on the level of how to cope with the masses, the repression, uh, the, the the communication on that level is is direct, and uh, we see what we experience. I think today in Europe is a very, very, very uh, radical uh, turn to that direction. At the moment that we see that the model itself is completely failing in uh, US, which makes it particularly interesting. How can you get rid of fear? I think we'd all agree on that. Like I think collective action is uh, really uh, the answer. Now how you can and whether you can actually encourage or move people to that direction by example. Uh, which also speaks to what you said about teaching. Teaching, it's not just in class. Teaching takes place everywhere. Uh, the, the most difficult, I think, question here that uh, none of us uh, picked up yet is uh, cancelling the debt. Yes. How do you move forward from that? What kind of programs can you adopt? And without, let's say, at the moment that this might happen individually just in Greece, without starving your people or without leading to, to, to greater devastation. This is, again, the need for coalitions, the need for collaborations, and also the need of exploring and understanding, and this I might speak a little bit to the need for a theoretical map, understanding and, stu and studying very closely the capacities of your own country, of your own people, and the possible collaborations. You might not be, Cyprus we were discussing like yesterday, Cyprus for example failed in its attempt to uh, secure resources like energy from uh, Soviet, I mean from Soviet, no? Russia, <laughs> from Russia, uh, but uh, there might be available other, 
other options. So, but this kind of discussions on very, very concrete problems, what kind of production Greece has or what kind of production can have, to what direction the economy could be restructured, where can we seek uh, energy, uh, sources of energy, within like a short term and then a long term uh, base, these discussions have not taken place. So these are very important and also sort of evaluate, yes, what the unions could or could not uh, offer or to what extent could be restructured or not. These are discussions that are actually to some extent are taking place and there is much more work I think that needs to be done to that direction and I think that would also be. Uh, now about the Greek euphoria, I think it's a question of relativism here. I think people looking from outside, from the United States where there is so little uh, resistance or like even from the perspective of the European left uh, and they see obviously the prospect of a leftist government in Greece that by itself creates some euphoria which by itself yes it doesn't do much but if we manage to capitalize on this and uh, while being very very self-critical okay and not just celebratory it might be something we need some sort of energy very good Thanks again for organizing this, my fellows. This is this is the international. You see the unity. You see yeah, the unity. we are forming. It's, it will it will it will take a little bit of time, Carlos. Sorry, I didn't want to turn you into a religious guy.